Yeah. Thank you very much. Talking about last time I knew it was interesting. You talked about going in the loop. You know, you had a feel that you could have that sound. And there's a formula for that, which I haven't come into the nominating. I haven't explored any science in the past. It's going to take time and it's going to be and you know it. And then I, okay? So, what's that expression? I could read everything in the same way. I thought that's what it was, but I wanted to make sure it wasn't an island. So if you assume this is an XY plane, I said, okay, so remember. I want to remember that and how we got it. If you don't remember that, well, it was only two days ago. Okay. That's why you want kind of want to look at your notes and reinforce. Because then you come in and you don't have to stop and think about things. Or at least it's more familiar to you. And and that's how you build understanding. Anyway, you've got that. So how are you going to apply that? It's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's not real straightforward here is what's I, but I pretty much pull it. Return to ring with delta R is and the delta R. So Instead of R, we're going to have lambda del R because the width of this ring is del R. Pretty much told you. But there's a step in thinking about that. Okay. And what's the radius of the ring? That's that's what was A when we did it, but now we'll call it R star. Okay. Okay, so now. Interval to this partition. You have a total field of two orders. Okay, so you know, the first thing we've done is we've looked at a typical ring in which, well, a typical ring centered at the origin because we know how to find the field from a circular loop current at the center. Okay, so we've got this, which we developed, what we developed by. Uh, now we have to add this up over all such rings. So there's an interval we should partition, which would be, and I ask you to think about it when you think it through, the interval from zero to A, because these rings run from the center out to the 
We just so it should be pretty obvious why we do that. Um, so partition. Our head will be zero to A. And we get yes. Take our typical increment, which we've already done, except we have put subscripts on it. Delta B sub I then, because of what we did in here without putting I, so we could put I part of it immediately. Okay. Two little round circles and a smiley face. And I was okay. Opposite. Okay. So we had our delta B sub I. Comes out in a straightforward manner from this. Then the sum of these things. Sum of I equals one. And And this approaches, of course, we can pack out all the constants. Including, okay, but that's constant. We get D all over R. Now there's going to be a big problem with this. And in smaller variable calculus, if I use this as an example, it's something we have to understand about the fields in general. But right now, well, go ahead. What's that interval? Okay, well, there's a problem with this because the integral is this natural law, okay? That's your graph. Natural log has a graph that looks like this because it's the inverse reaction input function. And you got an asymptote with the y axis. Okay, and there are other ways to think about why the natural log of zero can't be defined. Uh, among other things, using the properties of laws, you would. Okay. We got the X circle around like zero there. Okay. Now, the question is either there's an error in this, or this is impossible. And I'm almost tempted to think there's an error. Because I think it is possible. As a matter of fact, I think one of the problems you're going to have in your problem set is 
you got a spinning disc. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's a spinning disc. Yeah, yeah it's spinning disc. That doesn't happen. Okay. You, can, you can do an insulated disc, obviously, and spin the thing. Does that mean that you get an infinite magnetic field at the center? Obviously not, because people spin insulated discs all the time, and sometimes they have charge. You can just put anything circular into your drill, and you probably have a more or less uniform, maybe small, but more or less uniform charge over that whole disc. And it depends. Their charges <laughs> okay, and and, and uh, maybe, you know maybe it's been rubbed against something or whatever. Uh, from spinning, maybe there's yeah, some kind of electric field present there, yeah, you know, in, in space, you know, uh, and there are ions in the air, and all kinds of things can happen. It'd be kind of fun to think through how that might happen, um, but that wouldn't be. A uniform current because the charge in the part of the disk closest to the center isn't moving as fast as the charge out here. So you might have a uniform charge density, but that's not going to give you a uniform amount of charge making it certain. Uh, Every revolution. Okay. Uh, so, in that case, what you have, I think it's almost obvious, and I'm not going to say whether it's obvious or not, I'm going to have to work through that problem. But we can just modify this by saying that, okay, well. This is apparently not possible. Then you think about how you would have to generate, what you'd have to do to generate this kind of a current with a magnetic field. You might generate a magnetic field of some kind. Okay. You might think that would be possible. Apparently not. You know, I mean, you can generate you know, a loop current. That's how induction stoves work. Okay, if we spin a magnet inside that Dutch oven, that iron Dutch oven there, we're going to induce currents. That would be a lot of eddy currents and all. It would be complicated. Uh, but uh, you, know, you want to think through the geometry of just how that works. Okay. And then you get to pull out all kinds of multi-verbal calculus. We're not going to do that. But we are going to measure some of those effects. Okay. So maybe we made a mistake over here. Maybe we did fall. Maybe I didn't interpret this right. Maybe I misled you. Maybe it really is impossible. And when you come up with something that contradicts what you think ought to be, that's when the fun starts. That's when you start learning stuff. I mean, if you're you know, an engineer, something bizarre is happening. You think I can figure it out or and it's good? Modify it. Same kind of same kind of process. Okay. So let's say Thank you. 
I'm going to make it I max times R over A. And what's that do? R over A is just your ratio of the radius of the circle here to the outer radius here. So your outer radius, you have a current that is equal to I max. At the center, well, it's obvious that in the very center, whatever charges sitting on the center or very close to the center to not be moving very fast at all. Okay. So it's going to give you practically a zero contribution to make that do it. Okay. So if you have this, how are you going to modify all of this? Now you can go back to the beginning. Well if you modify this then it's obvious how you modify the enemy. Okay. Because almost everything is going to be the same, except something is going to be different inside the interval. It's going to be obvious what should be different according to what's been here. So, what's different? Write it out if you can. Okay. Now, what happens is this. Is what you replace your lambda with. But you really want to place your lambda delta r with something because you need a delta r. Okay. So the question is the amount of current you have in a ring here. Okay. I of R is just over a circle. Okay. The circle has no thickness. Since that circle has no thickness, there's no charge to circulate. This is like the current density. Okay. So let me clarify this. And, you know, it, it would have been better because I, I think there's a little confusion. It could have. Maybe it should have when we started. Being very rigorous from the right place. All that land will on. Right. Uh, and instead of I max, we call it lambda max. Well, Kind of resisted that rotation because I didn't want to make it just okay, whatever this is, you plug it in for length. Okay, that's what it's going to come back to. Okay, the typical loop is now. Lambda of R star delta R. So 
I rewrite this. We just replaced my lambda by, by lambda of r star. Okay. And that's going to be by k prime prime the mass. Times R star over a tilde R I'll give them the numbers. You know, you tell me what this means. It just means that R is equal to A. What can we say to use lambda max? R star is equal to zero by current density. It's equal to zero. Lambda max. Okay. And what happens if the R star? Don't have an R in the denominator. And this equals what it is. If you write it out, you're going to end up with the integral. So it's going to be two pi. You cry. Found the max of dr is zero a. Well, all I'm integrating is dr. It's going to get two pi. Two pi lambda. Yeah. Time to have the written A. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Just pulling my hand. There it is. Okay, unless I left something out. Have I left it out? Okay, so we did leave something out. So that that A and you know, that doesn't go away. Have an A there. Of course, I have an A there. That ain't going to I get this. Is that other units? The lambda max is going to be in amps per meter. Okay. This is in. Tesla meters per amp. The first one of Tesla. Okay. Unless I said that wrong, unless I'm going to have this wrong, well, it pretty much has to. If the symbols are right. Okay, well, this means it doesn't matter how big the disk is.
you end up with the same result for the magnetic field. Is that intuitively reasonable? What do you want to think about it? Okay. So there might still be a flaw there. Well, actually, your book works this out for you. If you read your text, it does a spinning disk with uniform charge density. And that's all this is. If you got uniform charge density, then uh, the speed of your charge is disproportional to how far you are from the center. Thank you. Let me back up a second. It doesn't mean necessarily you want to think through this. If you got a bigger disk with the same charge density, you still get the same field at the center. And you might think about why. In other words, read your text and think about it. Okay, we've seen the lab that we wouldn't use this because it'll attract up as little. But if this was copper, okay, now from a distance, you know, we look at this thing, it's got a, you know, it's getting shaped like this, it's cross section, okay? It's not symmetric. Not radially symmetric about an axis. Although, if you're like this far away from it, it acts pretty much like it's radially symmetric because little differences in distances from different parts of the conductor become pretty relatively insignificant. But if you're close to it, they become very significant. Okay. Now, if this is a copper conductor and Look up a battery with this end and this end and read the circuit, right? Um, you're going to get a magnetic field. And if you measure the magnetic field from any significant distance, well, over the top of this thing, if the current's in this direction, the magnetic field's going to be this way. Where like so, it's in this direction. It, it forms a Loop, much like the picture you see here. Well, this would be the magnetic field of a conductor, except that the field would be dropping off the distance. And you're going to have problems asking to do the animals with that. Okay. Um, and we've concentrated on setting up intervals and so forth. Don't have time to set them all up unless I just do it really fast. And if I do it really fast, it's going to accelerate. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe you get a, a sense of it that shows you the uh, slow way in detail. Okay. Well, anyhow. Let this make a bit of Okay. Well, just last time, yesterday, the multivariable calculus, we did a Working on that dot bell S, right? So I don't have to talk much about line intervals. You already know how to do these line intervals. But if you do a line interval of a field that looks like this around a loop, around a circle, and if the thing is circularly symmetric, well, this field is always parallel to the loop and always in the same magnitude. And that's that would be true if this was a cylinder, a circular cylinder, symmetric about its axis. Your magnetic field around here would be the same at every point, and again, it would have the same magnitude at every point um, on a circle that surrounds this conductor. So you would just have to multiply the magnetic field by the circumference of the circle to get the line of it. If you have a real conductor that isn't circularly symmetric, 
symmetric bottom matrix. So then you don't have a constant magnetic field. If that magnetic field of constant magnitude, and it's not necessarily always parallel to the circular path. Okay. One thing doesn't make any difference. No matter how irregular this cross section and so forth, no matter what the shape of this conductor, no matter how weird it could be a flat conductor, it could be 14 randomly located wires. Okay. Within some radius. If you integrate the magnetic field about any path, circular or not, around this thing, it's just going to be a simple multiple. The line integrals is going to be a simple multiple. It's correct. Okay. And this is going to be very useful for magnetic field of solenoids. Okay, what's a solenoid? That's like those Helmholtz coils, but it's long. So you got wires tightly wrapped around some core of some length. And that core is something that increases your magnetic permittivity, permittivity iron typically. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a pretty easy concept. Just means that calculate your magnetic field, assuming that there's just a vacuum inside and air is very close to a vacuum. It'd be like three to percent difference or something like that. Okay. If you put iron in the middle, the right type of iron, then you can get up to maybe 80 times field. It feels a lot like what dielectrics do with capacitors. When you put a dielectric in there, you multiply the field that you would have if you had a vacuum. And that's something you should be familiar with. Okay. So same idea. You just put this iron core in here. Okay, that's fine. Maybe you don't put an iron core. If you put an iron core in there, uh, maybe it's depending on the iron 40 times as strong as it would have been if you just calculate it with that. And you just got this constantly put in front of it, which kind of is a constant for electric permittivity. You put a different size to the and all that stuff. Okay, well, here you got this thing. Okay, let's say you got 100 loops in this distance. Okay. Then what you do is you say, okay, I want to get the magnetic field inside here. So I'm going to take it's easier to think of a thing if I've got an other one that abstracts something. Okay. Okay, so again, let's say we got a hundred coils around this thing, this end of this one, and they're uniformly spaced. Then I take a path from inside here to outside. So maybe the path, uh, part of the path is the central axis. So my path goes like this, comes up out of here like this and down. Okay. I want the magnetic field along that central axis. I know if I know the current and how many loops I've got, I know how much current that path is enclosing. So I know that the path integral is just a simple multiple of the enclosed current. Okay. I can then extend this path as far as I want up this way, like so, until the top of the path is so far away from here that there's essentially no magnetic field out there. By the symmetry, 
the magnetic field along this and this path, depending on how I choose the path. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll set that up in a minute. But here's the idea magnetic field here, and here's parallel to the path. Okay. Well, there's some qualifiers. But, uh, so the only contribution to the magnetic field is along here. Well, the magnetic field of any loop is parallel to the axis, and I can use that to calculate the field of the solid. It's the center. Now, let me draw that on the board. And so what I've got here is a bunch of loops. Around with where flowing like so. What I gestured with the cylinder there might have been a little misleading. I'm going to choose a path that comes down here and through the center. Back up here. This been a long ways away. Okay. If I go in, Luke's my notation is probably going to diverge from the text. If I have to look that. Okay. See how we should sort it up. So end loops at a distance of a. I don't like to use B for distance because we're using transportation for different purposes. What's the derivative of distance with respect to x? dd dx? From too many things. Fan loops and distance a. Now, now, implicitly, this is a rectangle. Read your book and we'll tell you that. Clean development. Okay. Uh, if this thing has a length. L in this direction. That's kind of like L down here because it's a rectangle. Then you got N over A times L loops surrounded by that path. Okay. Let's say we have a current I.
takes the current from the wire. The wire penetrates the loop this many times. And you got this total current. Integral over the path. I put a little circle on this integral sign to indicate it's a closed path. You know, drawn and closed. Really, broke. I was saying that it's closed as part of the setup. Integral over the path. Oh. B dot D S. It's a multiple of this. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what that multiple is, but we'll figure it out in a minute. Okay. Multiple of I times N over A times L, and it's a known multiple, universally known multiple, it's just a constant, universal constant. We have K prime and all that stuff. Okay. Okay. You know. um, but, Symmetry if the path isn't close to the ends, and then drawing it to the symmetry close to the ends. The magnetic field And then it feels parallel to these vertical sides. Also, negligible of what we call the top of the path. So we pretty much get zero from all this. Okay. And if it's not vertical, well, it's equal and opposite here. Okay. Uh, and actually, I probably should have said that. Actually, by the symmetry, I said symmetry. By the symmetry, by the symmetry, this part of the path goes one direction, this part of the path goes the other direction. But the magnetic field is same at any given distance along this path as it is along any given distance along this path, so that two contributions cancel. Okay. So I'll say if this path isn't close to the ends of uh,
Kind of along the vertical panels, panels along the vertical. Well. And the point then is that the entire integral is just equal to the integral along this axis part. It should be axial times L. L is the length here. And B axial is magnetic field. Well, the axial. Okay, so. B axial times L has to equal whatever this multiple is of this. Okay. To figure out what that multiple is, all we got to do is think about a single wire. Okay. Thin wire carrying current I. What's the magnetic field of that wire? Yeah. Distance A. Okay. So that's fairly easy to do. I mean, there's an integral to perform them. Okay. So you can figure out what that multiple is. Of course, the book is going to develop the same thing. And the thing I want to illustrate here is not the details of the constants involved. Okay. Might be like 2.85, something like that. Okay. Not going to work there. I'll let you, let, let you see that. Uh, so you're going to have something like that. It's probably going to be time bomb. It's probably going to be K prime on U naught, V no prime. That'll be the moment we have here. And it's going to be equal to this. Well, if you set this equal to that, that multiple is this, L divides out. I mean, obviously, the amount of current you cut here is proportional to L and the length over which you're integrating this axial field is proportional to L. So it's going to be a factor of both expressions is going to divide out and you're going to get the axial field is some multiple of I times N over A. And you both probably use some sides N and A. But it's going to come down to that. Okay. I mean, it, there are different ways to do that. You can talk about the density of loops, number of loops for you the length. And that might be a capital N, which I don't think is a good use for a capital N because that invokes a number rather than the number per unit length. So I chose to do this. So be careful about what your book uses for N. Understand the concept. It's not a particularly difficult concept. If you accept what I said about what happens along these three sides. Okay. And the fact that the flash symmetry magnetic field pretty much has to be uniform. Another thing is that the magnetic field, at least not too close to the ends of this thing, is pretty uniform throughout the solar. And we can have most coils. Magnetic field turns out to be pretty uniform within that. So near the very edges where the magnetic field isn't really all that much, all that parallel to the axis of the bars. Uh, you have a pretty uniform field because of this. With this path inside of the Hemmels coils, you get something very similar. Okay.
Okay, so here's a course. And we just do a path and through here. Come up here, over here, and down here. Okay. We cut maybe a couple hundred of these wires. So that's penetrated by a lot of current. Okay. All moving in the same direction. So now we know what the integral along this path of the magnetic field is. It's the same integral used for work, F dot ds for B dot ds. It's a line integral. That's what the line integral of F dot ds, whatever F is, whatever vector field it is. Okay. Uh, same argument. Okay. Everywhere along this part of the path, you have the same field that you have along this part of the path. At least parts of the magnetic field parallels to the path. Maybe it's out this way a little bit here. Maybe it's out this way a little bit here. Okay. But it's still essentially uh, mostly up, mostly down here, as well as we can use your right hand to pick that up. So that along this part of the path, you're either in the same direction as a magnetic field or the opposite. And along this one, or the other way to the magnetic field, meaning that your integral here is going to be more opposite to your area. Along the top, you just make the top as far away as you need to so that there's no contribution there since so the whole contribution is here. If you're not real close to the edges, magnetic field by symmetry arguments is going to be more tall. So it's going to be fairly uniform. It's pretty. Important argument and not that difficult to understand. Not trivial, you got to think about it. So you kind of internalize it until you really identify it. And some people would better visualize it three dimensions so it's another. And so, depending on how good you are at it, uh, that's what you have. Okay, well, that's I have here. Now, there's another configuration, which is a circular solenoid. Just take a donut and wrap it. Okay, I preferably not a real donut. Okay, uh, I got behind a guy in the grocery store the other day, and he looks fairly healthy. This little guy, it's a little overweight, you know, probably close to my age. Uh, he's got a shopping cart with several cases of Coke. Okay. A dozen donuts, something else that is full of sugar, and a gallon of milk. <laughs> uh, he, looks, he looks like he's reasonably healthy, but man, if he eats like that all the time, I worry about him. Seems like a pretty good guy. I don't want him to drop dead on us, but I'm not going to go and find some of this. But on his diet, <laughs> I might find out what kind of shape he's in. I might not like the results. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that is in my first guy. Uh, I just thought, oh man. And all I've got is a cart full of beans. <laughs> well, that was slow. Beans and vegetables. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that, that's kind of the end of that. Again, if you wrap <laughs> this thing around the dough, I, I shouldn't have thought of the dough. But that was in the video yesterday. Uh, if you wrap it around the donut, then you're going to have to use a path that follows a circle inside. Okay. Uh, and um, it's actually kind of simpler than this in many ways. You get a slightly different formula for the properties of the solenoid. Okay. In the property of solenoids, it's basically how much magnetic field you get when you go to the And uh, we'll be talking about that. Okay.
there's a lot more to get into the problem. There's a lot to learn here, and especially if you're going to be an electrical, you're going to want to know as much of it as you can because it'll make your life tremendously, tremendously easier when you get into more advanced courses. So the more you learn here, the easier your life is going to be in the future. But of course, the more miserable your life is going to be in the meantime. Balance that out.